and welcome to Leaders of Tomorrow, India's only daily television platform for small businesses. Over the past seven years, we've understood what matters most to you, the entrepreneur. And in year eight, we're taking head on two of your most pressing concerns, that of funding and mentoring. I'm Sananda Jai Seelan. On the show tonight, a very special masterclass with Ajay Piramal himself. I spoke to him about his entrepreneurial journey over the past five or six decades, what philanthropy really means to him, why it's so close to his heart, what some of the causes close to his heart are, as well as what his advice is for small businesses. This Thank you so much for doing this special interview here on the Leaders of Tomorrow, uh, Mr. Piramal. And you know, it's always inspirational to talk to leaders like yourself, particularly given that uh, small businesses say that they can't have enough of the advice given by experts like yourself. I want to start by, uh, you know, starting right at the beginning. Um, your initial days when you joined, uh, you know, the family business was when you were really young, and you started in a sector that at that time wasn't doing really well, the textile space. Uh, and uh, you've had quite a journey since then. Well, what were those initial days like? And uh, for small businesses who are watching this interview, who are largely part of family-owned and run businesses, uh, what were those initial days like? What perhaps helped you? So uh, just after I did my MBA, uh, I got into business the next day mm -hmm. because that was just assumed in those th days, which was in uh, 1977, that you went into business straight away. Sure. In fact, I remember that even in the holidays before that, when we were in uh, college, we used to go into, uh, to, into the textile mills just to see how they worked. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I learned from those days was that uh, I was fortunate that my father actually started giving me responsibility pretty young, when I was very young. Sure. And when I was just like uh, 24, he actually uh, gave me an independent company to run, mm -hmm. which was in the engineering tools uh, business. So I was very ha happy that I could make some mistakes, I could learn and uh, gave me a lot of confidence which has worked in the future. So one lesson that I've learned is that if you can take response, if you get responsibility early on and give a, uh, you ca then learn how to navigate through the mistakes that you make and uh, that's one important learning. Okay, one thing that uh, you know we um, ask very often on the show is: Do you think there is enough understanding of why failures, perhaps in some sense, in the Indian making mistakes, failures uh, in the Indian entrepreneurial ecosystem? Do you think there's enough understanding and importance given to that? Frankly, I don't think enough importance is given to failures, and people must know that if you have to uh, go up in life, you have to make some uh, mistakes. You have to make failures. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Because if you see those people who have been really successful are the ones who've gone with the not so not on the beaten track mm -hmm. they've done something where nobody else has traveled mm -hmm. and obviously you have to make uh, you have to make some mistakes in that mm -hmm. and i would encourage people to do that you have to make mistakes provided you learn from them and don't keep repeating them it's good our environment did not allow for that because early on if you see when i see the elder people they came at least a generation before me they came which was a, a generation of scarcity uh, equity markets were small valuations were small so people did not have that much of uh, uh, capital with them and yeah. therefore they wanted to preserve it and therefore risk taking was not encouraged mm -hmm. but in today's environment i think uh, you have to take risks and that's where you can make much more wealth than what you can do okay. earlier. A lot of experts like yourself, you know, and when we pose this question to them about what's it going to take for India's entrepreneurs to be more accepting of failure, maybe not perhaps on the lines of what we see happening uh, globally, say Silicon Valley, etc., but at least be more acceptance, uh, accepting really of mistakes, etc., say it goes all the way back to our education system and really, you know, the, the open-mindedness that is required and the changes that are required in the education system. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think uh, education system and the whole environment where you have to celebrate failure. It's not necessary that because you're a failure once or twice that you have 
you know, you have given up in life. Sure. I remember going to Israel and when I met entrepreneurs, se several of them had really failed six, seven times and yet done startups which were very successful later. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the whole uh, environment that we have to create. The fact that there are now several VC firms and others coming up who are willing to fund entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. I think that's also very important. Okay, I want to move slightly ahead and talk about the fact that, you know, you've been uh, a business businessman for about four or five decades now. What perhaps is the biggest change that you've seen, uh, both perhaps in what's happening around you in the ecosystem, but also how you've seen yourself changing and growing really to those, those changes? So one of the things that I find in the ecosystem is that today there are people who are much more, I, I think they're more enterprising than before. Mm -hmm. I also find that earlier on, people who were entrepreneurs came from a sort of a privileged class. But now you find that there are people all across the country that are coming from. It's not only necessarily from the big cities, yeah. it's not necessarily from families who were you know, rich earlier and these are kids of rich uh, families, but there are people from all over. So that's a very exciting thing, I think. Okay. It's uh, very promising. Second thing is the fact is that with the whole, India is getting much more integrated into the world uh, order of economic order and therefore we have to become competitive on a global scale. Sure. You cannot remain just insulated within India. Sure. Thirdly, I think with the advent of technology and so on, we have to be and a lot more regulations coming through, mm -hmm. one has to be much more sensitive to that, to see that we follow it in letter and spirit. And that's where I think the younger people must, early on you could get away with things, sure. but today I don't think we should and one needs to be very careful in that. Okay, so on this uh, masterclass on entrepreneurship then, uh, if I could, uh, you know, in some sense put you on the spot and say three opportunities, three, you know, challenges for India's entrepreneur today, for the young entrepreneur today, in your mind, what would it be? So the opportunities are really, it's your whole, uh, it is, the whole world is open to yeah, you. Yeah. And it is for you to be able to identify where there is a need that a customer have and very often there's a need that you can create for the customer. Sure. When you see some of the most successful companies, who would have thought that you would have needed what an Amazon does today? Mm. But they keep on adding more and more new products and services. So to have an open mind and not just to think what is available and what is needed, but what more can be done, I think that's the biggest mm. opportunity. The second opportunity is that if it's a good idea, I think, and if you can communicate it well, you can, uh, there is uh, funding available. Mm. As far as the challenges are uh, concerned, yeah, it is very competitive and more and more people are going to do the same and therefore you have to be able to rise up to it. Mm. You have to be resilient because you need to have the courage to take both success and failure in your stride. Sure. Uh, you're talking about uh, funding just now and also, you know, when we started this conversation, you said when you started out, funding perhaps or access to capital really was one of the biggest challenges, not so much now. Uh, I want to talk about what's really happening when it comes to funding for small businesses, uh, given your expert role, of course, in, in industry, and to talk about, uh, you know, where, where, where really is the money for small businesses? Because most companies that we're talking to are still pointing to challenges when it comes to fundraising. And I'm talking about small entrepreneurs. Any sort of concern that you can talk about either from the economy point of view, you know, the big picture. What do you think it's going to take to change? So, so the big picture is today there is a there is a squeeze on funding. Sure. That's also because if you look at the small entrepreneurs, the funding for the small entrepreneurs was really done by the NBFCs. Yeah. It's yeah. very difficult for banks to understand what the business of a small entrepreneur is and to understand the risks. Mm -hmm. NBFCs, because of the environment in the last uh, 14 months, have actually slowed down. So yeah. today it is a challenge, but I don't think that it's a permanent challenge. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what I would suggest to entrepreneurs is, first of all, one has to be conservative in their funding. In other words, don't stretch the debt equity ratios to be too high. Okay. Second thing is that one must have enough of a good data within their company to good MIS system to understand what is the really performance of the business, what is the fund requirement, plan well in advance, 
keep the lenders informed about what uh, is the business, whether it's good, bad, build confidence. I think that's when they would get funds. Okay. Uh, through this interview, if you could also give our entrepreneurs your views on, uh, you know, uh, on the economy in some sense that IMF on one hand is saying sustained slowdown, the finance minister is saying India is looking good at least compared to what's happening globally. Uh, for a small business who's watching this interview, for an entrepreneur watching this interview, what would you want to say? I think for a small entrepreneur, I would say that one must not look at general economy. Whether the Indian economy goes at 5% or 8%, it doesn't matter for them. Sure. They must look in their particular industry. Mm -hmm. So even today, if you look at it, there are certain industries which are doing well. There are others which are not doing so well. So they have to understand which are the industries that they are serving, sure. or which is the markets they are serving, and then take a call whether it's doing well or not. Otherwise, either there is euphoria or there's gloom, which may not be relevant for your own business. So let's not take decisions based on what the headline are in the newspapers. Okay, one last question in terms of you know the big picture on the environment before we talk on philanthropy. Uh, and I do want to uh, talk about, you know, you said, while there's some stress on NBFCs, etc., the government on its part, for instance, you have the Mudra scheme, you have the CGT, MSE scheme, etc., for small businesses. Do you think enough on that is really being done to ease the NPA situation for small businesses? I think as, a, uh, the end, uh, the, as far as small businesses are concerned, what we really need to understand is as, uh, that they must be able to estimate what their early requirements are and communicate them well. And if they do that, they could, there are options available for them to fund. But again, I think what is important for all businesses is that they must have a value-based organization where they really live by values because that's what will create a value in the long term. Let's slip into a short break on that note, but we will continue bringing you this masterclass on entrepreneurship and philanthropy with Ajay Pirman. That's on the other side. Just stay tuned. Welcome back. You're with us here on Leaders of Tomorrow and tonight a masterclass on entrepreneurship and philanthropy with Ajay Piraman. I want to talk philanthropy and that's something which is very, very close to your heart. Uh, before I talk about some of the specific causes that you're associated with, I want to get your views on why philanthropy. Why philanthropy for small businesses? I think it's a why philanthropy for anybody. Okay. Why are we, as you see, that if you believe in the cycle of rebirth, mm -hmm. you get human life only after several millions of lives as a small, whether it's a creature or sure. so on. And the only organism which can differentiate between what is right and what is wrong mm -hmm. is the human being. If you are a tiger, you do three or four things only in life. Mm -hmm. you, I, you really, you are there to protect yourself so that you don't get injured. You're there so that you can get food. You're there to procreate. That's sure. all that you do. Sure. But a human being has the ability to do much more. And I think, therefore, we must understand this as a gift that, that you're born a human being. And our role is to see that we make a positive difference to the world around us. And that's why philanthropy. Philanthropy could be in terms of money, it can be in terms of time, it can be in terms of service. Whatever one can do, big or small, one has to give back. That's the obligation that we owe to the world. Uh, what do you think, though, uh, is perhaps the biggest thing that you're seeing right now when it comes to young people who are associated with giving back, CSR, philanthropy, etc.? Uh, you were saying it's not just about money, it's also time involved, etc. Do you think there's enough understanding of that? Do you think that's perhaps where the challenges lie for small businesses, for young entrepreneurs? I think more and more I, f I feel that people are becoming more responsible okay. towards giving back. Uh, obviously, more can be done, and whatever we do is not enough. Mm -hmm. In a country like ours, there's a lot more to be done. The difference between the haves and the have-nots is only increasing. Mm -hmm. 
Besides that, I think there are so many opportunities, there are so many areas that we can work. In almost all the development indices, the human development indices, India as a country is behind. We may say that we are a developed world or a developing world. We can say that our economy is amongst the top five uh, largest economies in the world, but yet there are many areas that we are f behind compared to many other nations, whether it's in the space of education, whether it's in the space of health, in nutrition, and so on. So therefore, we need to do much more. Two particular areas that you're talking about, uh, health, um, nutrition and education, um, and that's you know, amongst the variety of causes that you're associated with and passionate about, those are two areas that you're uh, particularly passionate about. Could you, you know, talk to us about that? So if you look at the uh, space of health, yeah. when you look at India has signed up for the SDGs, yes. the Sustainable Development Goals, that we should be there by 2030. But if you look at many of the areas, we are far behind and a lot more needs to be done, whether it's in infant mortality, whether it's in maternal mortality. We worked in one of the tribal districts in Andhra Pradesh called Araku, mm. which is very, very backward. The numbers for uh, infant mortality and maternal mortality are like two and a half times the average of India and almost five times of the, uh, uh, above what we have to be to meet the sustainable development goals. And therefore, that's where we work. We've been working there for the last 13 years, and we found that in the last two years, we've been able to reduce and actually bring it down to better levels of infant mortality than even the global averages and maternal mortality. Sure. So there are, let's say about 10% of India's population is only tribal. Mm. So can one work in these areas? So that's just one example that I could give you, and that's what we are working in today. In what are the prime ministers, uh, Prime, Prime Minister has identified 117 districts in India, which are the aspirational districts, mm -hmm. where a lot more needs to be done so that they can come up to the level of the other districts. Mm -hmm. That's where we are working on, whether it's in terms of health, whether it's in terms of nutrition, whether it's in terms of education. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you also talk about the work that you're doing with uh, ISCON? I do know that you're particularly associated as well as with Pratham when it comes to education. So uh, Pratham is the largest NGO as far as uh, education is concerned mm. for the young te and teenage children. Sure. So there we are working on several, uh, we've been working now for several years now, I think Pratham is going to complete its 25th year now, 20th year, sorry. Mm. And I've been with it for almost since the start of the organization. We are doing now several children in India. The Read India campaign is one of the biggest uh, contributors of uh, Pratham, mm -hmm. where we see it, where our whole purpose is to see that every child is in school and is learning well. Mm -hmm. So that is the objective, and we have reached till now millions of children. In fact, I'm happy to say that the Nobel Prize, which was given for uh, the Nobel Prize for, uh, for Mr. Abhijit Banerjee and Professor Duflo was really based, one of the important contributors to this was the work that uh, they had done through the j -PAL Institute at MIT for Pratham. Yeah, uh, the Bain Phil uh, Philanthropy Report for 2019, which has just come out, has in fact pointed to the fact that uh, uh, you know contributions and donations, if we can call it that, by ultra net worth, uh, ultra high net worth individuals, has slipped over the past few years. Uh, do you think that's maybe a worrying cause, or do you think that you know people are doing a lot, but it's perhaps not being publicly stated? So I haven't read the report, but I can only say that I'm glad that the government put the 2% CSR. Okay. So in some ways, I'm seeing that corporates now, and the large corporates are actually giving a significant amount in terms of the CSR. So sure. as I look at the projects that we are involved with, whether it is with ISKCON, whether it's with Pratham, uh, we are with our own foundation, we are finding that actually the uh, contributions have gone up. Okay, I, I'm glad you brought up the 2% CSR, I was just going to come to that. A lot of people who speak to us say that it's not, um, you know, it's not the best way to perhaps encourage businesses to give back by mandating that you give back. Uh, do you think that 
perhaps it is moved at least we needed some sort of push for businesses i i, I support it i think it's good as i said uh, that uh, when uh, companies are actually obliged to give it they start looking for opportunities and that's a good way to do things sure uh, i want to talk your philosophy when it comes to a philanthropy and giving back in csr and how leaders like yourself are encouraging your employees to be passionate about causes perhaps the same causes as yourself or other causes but to ensure that it's an organization wide sort of initiative or movement that it's bottom up and not just top down so in our organization we have several initiatives which we are doing with employees we call and we uh, ask them it's not mandatory but we ask them to give a certain number of hours every year towards philanthropy it doesn't have to necessarily be in our initiatives it could be in any initiative so our foundation and some other volunteers who are working in the business try and identify places or different variety of organizations in different locations where people can come and give so that's one i think an important part because people should one is to give uh, money but the other is also to give your time and when you can engage with that that's where the real value comes okay. also we also have a give india uh, <clears throat> the scheme where if the employee gives uh, a certain amount from their payroll every year which every month we call that the payroll giving where the company matches an equal amount so there are some of these things that are being done okay uh, let me close this interview down by talking about you know your 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 personal side as well and uh, if you had perhaps one piece of advice that you received over your own journey your own professional journey that's changed how you approach business that's changed the way you think that you'd want to use as advice for us small businesses what so i have a think? few things which sure. i have found useful one is as i said that if you lead a value based business and a life it's it creates huge economic value i think that's one lesson that i've learned i've also learned that it's always good to be humble in business because you may be as successful but there are times when you will not be and therefore humility is really important the third thing is that one must also go through everybody in life has to go through their ups and downs so that equanimity during the high and the low is so important and finally i believe that you have to have faith in a higher power all right sir thank you very much for your time here on the leaders of tomorrow thank you thank you Right, completely out of time on this uh, very special masterclass. If you have any feedback for us, or you want to hear uh, from more experts like R J Piramal, here's how you let us know. Our contact details up on your screens in just a moment. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.